In rural New York, two unlikely sisters would inspire a national obsession with the occult. Magic would once again capture imaginations. On March 31, 1848, sisters Leah and Margaret Fox publicly declared that they had contacted spirits from beyond the grave. An American fascination for communicating with the dead occurred almost overnight. The Fox sisters used a technique called a seance, which quickly became one of America's most popular pastimes. People gathered in a darkened room while a medium tried to make contact with the spirit world. There would be tambourines and other bells that would sound, and the medium would actually be able to exude you know, ectoplasm from their nostrils or their mouth, and it was this sort of spiritual substance that allowed the spirits of the dead to manifest and make and appear. And in other cases, the medium would simply become a conduit or a channel through which the, the deceased were able to speak. Many who practiced spiritualism believed it would lead to scientific proof of the existence and immortality of the soul. And they gained an iconic champion when the Russian-born Madame Blavatsky arrived in New York at the height of spiritualism's popularity. She soon became the self-proclaimed decoder of ancient occult secrets. She grew up in a wonderful occult library that her father had established. She could see the connections between different cultures, spiritual teachings, and she was attempting to correct the errors of Christianity by bringing in mysticism and spirituality from other cultures. Born in the Ukraine in 1831 to a lower-ranking nobleman, Blavatsky was married early, but she abandoned her husband to spend 10 years traveling the world. She claimed to have studied with mystical adepts in India and Tibet. The exotic cigar-smoking medium became a sensation in the occult circles. She just wouldn't accept limits. She was one of the most educated person anybody who met her had ever met. And they couldn't understand, how could this powerful intellect be in this female body, just chewing up the landscape and producing this tremendous inspiration? Blavatsky's seances were the talk of New York. Mysterious letters would appear, written by spiritual leaders she called the Great White Brotherhood. Blavatsky was not above kind of taking advantage of the popularity of seances to push her own cause, and she used these seances to in very spectacular effect to materialize letters written by these um, ascended masters as instructions being passed down to her. The Brotherhood dictated to her the books that became the foundation of a new science of mysticism, Theosophy. Blavatsky wrote um, essentially two gigantic uh, collections, Isis Unveiled and The Secret Doctrine, which purported to be the teachings, the secret teachings of this kind of Eastern uh, Brotherhood, the mystery schools of initiation and she totally altered the spiritual landscape of Western civilization by introducing those concepts. She was very much a pioneer in bringing ideas of Eastern esotericism into the West. She focused on the similarities between Christianity and Hinduism and Buddhism and other spiritual traditions, arguing that there is in fact a tradition that underlies all spiritual faiths in the world. Blavatsky regarded her work as spiritual science and made connections between recent scientific advancements and occult beliefs. Blavatsky promoted the ancient Eastern mystical view that the essential nature of the world was not matter, but energy, which foreshadowed the discoveries of modern physics. Blavatsky also revived the Eastern beliefs in reincarnation and karma, Quickly acquiring a cult following, she launched the Theosophy Society. The term Theosophy, which Blavatsky coined, really comes from two words they are of Greek origin. One is Theos, which means God, and Sophia, which means wisdom. So the Theosophical Society was teaching divine or sacred wisdom. The Theosophical Society spread internationally and still exists in many countries. Blavatsky was hailed by her followers as the mother of the New Age. But for all of Blavatsky's charisma, she soon fell victim to her own success. 
And at the time that she was becoming famous, this business of spiritualism and channeling and especially uh, seances where you'd call up your dead ancestors, that was going all over the Western world and she felt like that was charlatanism. And so she wanted to represent an, a model that stepped outside of that and spoke to the verities, the truths, the larger things. But unfortunately in the end, she got reduced down to the very thing she was trying to fight. In 1885, Blavatsky was investigated by London Society for Psychical Research. It concluded that her seances were rigged. Writings didn't magically come from beyond the grave. There was a spring-loaded device in the bedroom above her chamber that allowed, it some, that allowed someone to put a letter into this device and have it drop down between the floorboards and materialize in their hands. Though many devoted followers refused to abandon Theosophy, Blavatsky was now tainted with fraud. She died soon afterwards. Her followers established a new headquarters in India where Theosophy thrived. A young protege, Krishnamurti, was identified as a reincarnated master and groomed to lead the Theosophy Society into the 20th century. Blavatsky's synthesis of Eastern and Western spirituality broke new ground in occultism. Well, who doesn't like to have secret knowledge? The idea of a private teaching. I mean, I think in a lot of ways that's the whole basis of the Internet, isn't it? Everybody claiming to have secret knowledge. Tonight, um, I'm really glad to be getting into this with the one guy in the country who can talk about it with authority, and that's Michael Gomes. He has uh, edited and annotated the work of Madame Blavatsky, H.P. Blavatsky. She was a woman who, in the 19th century, was synonymous with esoteric information. Uh, and as somebody who had uh, traveled the world to learn our darkest secrets and then condense it all into one place, uh, Madame Blavatsky um, set up uh, the kind of teaching and writing schedule that almost killed her. Uh, but she survived at least long enough to see the publication of the secret doctrine in her lifetime, and, and it's something which has rarely gone out of print. Now it's back in a new soft cover edition, and we will explore the secrets of the universe, the origins of humankind, and all of the things that you've wondered about tonight, coming up next hour on Coast to Coast AM with Ian Punnett, The Secret Doctrine. We'll do open lines coming up next. It's a continuation of last night's open lines, which I had a great time doing on Coast to Coast. If you missed that, then what are the secret teachings in The Secret Doctrine? What is it that she discovered through all of these travels uh, that she had to get down on paper uh, and 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 even die from uh, in giving birth to it. The secret doctrine will get into the actual history of humankind, the origins of the universe, and so much more next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. Um, what of the of the secret teachings that we'll be talking about? Um, what was her view? What did she learn in her travels uh, and the knowledge that was revealed to her that would inform us as to the creation of the universe? Okay. There's a, a really nice little quote from her first book, Isis and Bill, which in turn you can say the secret doctrine is two volumes just expanding on this very short idea. And in Isis she says that esoteric philosophers held that everything in nature is but a materialization of spirit. The eternal first cause is latent spirit, they said, and matter from the beginning. With the first idea, which emanated from the double-sexed and hitherto inactive deity, the first motion was communicated to the whole universe, and the electric thrill was instantaneously felt throughout the boundless space. Spirit begat force, and force matter, and thus the latent deity manifested itself as a creative energy. So, you know, with her, God is the universal mind diffused through all things. So you have this spirit in turn, which manifests in our world as matter. Okay. You know, that sounds a lot like uh, Christian science. And you can see because those ideas are coming up, and you find that a lot of the theosophists became uh, interested in 
you know, the New Thought movements, a lot of the right. spiritual healing movements. It's, right. She gave a philosophy or a reasoning behind people's beliefs. She really helped popularize these ideas of previous continents like Lemuria and Atlantis. And she says, this would interest you, Ian, that a new sixth race is going to develop a sixth sense and will slowly begin to emerge here in America. So America is this home of a new consciousness that's going to be developing. And, and that's the next race. That's the next sixth race who will have this sixth sense. She uses this idea of a sixth sense long before it becomes popularized. Um, w w I want to follow that up, but let's push it back to the Lumerians and the Atlanteans. Where was Lumeria? Now, also with these ideas, if you look at in the introduction, I also say, she says there are seven different ways of interpreting these things. So it could be a literal interpretation that she's talking about. It could be allegorical. But Lemuria is supposed to be throughout the Pacific, uh, from, you know, India throughout the Pacific, out of which places like Easter Island are the, the, the mountaintops of uh, this continent that sank beneath the seas. And then, of course, the, the following humanity then develops on Atlantis, which is in the Pacific, I mean, in the, in the Atlantic Ocean. In the Atlantic. Yeah. Um, although the, I have heard an argument that uh, Easter Island that there may be a relationship to Atlantis with Easter Island. Um, I, I thought it was an interesting argument. But where, where, what was the, did, it, did Lumeria have a similar history or story arc as Atlantis? It, with Lumeria, Lumeria, which is this uh, third race, it initially starts out as being androgynous. She says, really, 18 million years ago, consciousness as we know it starts developing. Before that, People didn't have this manas, this mind faculty, and so mind starts developing, and humanity, which was once our androgynous, becomes male and female. Hmm. I know, uh, right? Yeah, I mean, so um, it, it wasn't. It, so we were all sort of androgynous beings, and then later on, almost like a kind of um, mitosis or something. Yes, yes. Our, our male part goes this way, and our yes, female yes. part goes another way. What? Um, you know. Did she believe that we could find out uh, who, from whom we were reincarnated? She doesn't talk so much. It's interesting. She doesn't talk about past lives a lot, uh, mainly because for her, the past person, of course, is not really this person. It's, it, you know, you have the stream of consciousness, and then the personalities are all strung on like pearls on a string. So they really aren't you know, the same person that is today. So you really couldn't say that Mr. Smith is Mr. Jones today. She doesn't deal with that at all, interestingly. What, what about other forms of consciousness, other life forms? Like... Certainly there are hierarchies, spiritual hierarchies that are more developed, you know, that she refers to in the secret doctrine as the Elohim in Hebrew, you know, right. the angels of the, before the throne. So you have all of these hierarchies out of which man is just a part of this. It's an idea that had been prevalent before called the great chain of being, you know, where everybody is interconnected with this divine spiritual progress. And it's always in this, this idea of progress. You know, you'd, I don't think she believed, for instance, in metempsychosis, where you could be born a human and then in your, if you were bad in your next life be born an animal, because that's not progress. That's going back into a lower form. So she certainly is not keen on that idea either. She would have been what we call into limited reincarnation, human-to-human -human reincarnation. Yeah, yeah. Even yeah. though you might be mentally worse, you'd be physically still developing onward. There's this, all of creation is this, you know, like a flower, de, you know, de blooming. Right. Uh, and so what did Madame Blavatsky, what did, what did she argue uh, was the proper place of somebody, um, a, a prophet like Jesus. Did she have a thought on that? Yes. She, in fact, uh, she writes to her aunt, you know, that the, what is the basis of all beliefs but to love God among, you know, before all things and thy neighbor as thyself. And as you know, this particular quote comes from the story in the gospel where, you know, the lawyer asked Jesus, you know, who is my, you know, where he asked him afterwards, well, who is my brother? Who is my neighbor? And, you know, Jesus gives this wonderful answer. So she certainly regards him as, you know, a the spiritual teacher. And, of course, she also has high words for the Buddha. Well, and what did she learn from Islam? 
she doesn't go into Islam so much. It's it's mainly Christianity and uh, Buddhism, Hinduism that are her her main sources. Uh, what about the Kabbalah? I, I would think she would have. Yes, eaten Kabbalah that up. is there, uh, especially as as one of the many theories. You know, it's amazing that she is able to see these commonalities within all of these disparate systems, which is quite unusual. Imagine, though, for a woman who had not been to school, had no education. Right. right. How did she do uh, this? This is, to me, the, the ponderance that I'm still faced with. Where do you see uh, the most evidence of plagiarism, uh, people stealing from Madame Blavatsky all these years later and claiming a uh, you know, sort of new thought? Well, I think it's like an echo. You know, certainly... The people in the 19th century read her, then the people who followed them read those people, and the people who followed them read those people. So you're getting an echo of a lot of the ideas that are floating around uh, today. And if you want to get to the source, you really have to go to the secret doctrine because it is it truly is a monument of modern esotericism. It is one of the great classics of just psychological literature.